All right, this is a 58-year-old physician, actually from uh, Las Vegas, who uh, said he's had no trouble with his ear at all until about, oh, five, six months ago. The ear blocked up, and um, uh, he uh, has a cholesteatoma in the posterior superior part of his middle ear, as far as I could tell. His ear is not ever drained. As you can see from the audiogram, he's got normal hearing in his right ear, a little bit of hearing loss in his left ear. So we've got a cholesteatoma and uh, hearing loss, no drainage problem, and uh, he's got the outside films. We didn't take any ourselves. Looks like he's got a fairly well pneumatized mastoid. So with that little bit, we'll go ahead to the microscope. Now I am looking right now at the superior, posterior superior part of the ear canal, and I will inject the vascular strip. Sorry about the syringe being in your way, but there you can see it balloon up. All right, suction. Roll the table towards me, please. Suction. Now, this will, uh, yeah, I'm a, quite a table mover, so you people will have to be with me all the time. Hold it. All right, let me have a, a number two knife. Now, I think that you can clearly see the uh, vascular strip ballooned out, and you can see the suture line. Here's the thick skin of the vascular strip, the thin skin. The suture line comes out like that and then curves. So I will put my knife in and cut along the suture line and come out like this, okay? Roll the table away some, please. Number one knife, hold it. Now you can clearly see the tympanosquamous suture line. Here is thick skin of the uh, vascular strip. There's thin skin. I'll put my instrument in like that and come right out the suture line. Now, suction. Here's where I do something different than you saw Malcolm do. For suction first. Now, I do not make an, I'm not going to make an incision. Uh, let me have a weapon. I will just elevate the vascular strip, and it'll probably pull some skin right off the eardrum. Uh, I will go ahead and put my instrument down and elevate the vascular strip like this so that it is elevated, and there it is. Now, once it is elevated to that extent, once it's elevated to that extent, then I will leave it. The reason for this is what I usually am, I'm usually at this magnification and this distance when I do it, and this is, uh, but I'll try to keep it a higher one at 10 for you. All right, now once I've done that, would you uh, let me have the beaver knife? Now, I find that it's easier to retract everything if I extend the tympanosquamous suture incision out a bit, and I will extend it out just a bit through the ear canal in that way. It doesn't come out far, as you can see, you can hardly, it's just through the outer third. Now, I want to outline, let me have a next larger size speculum. I want to outline the edge of the bone where we're going to want to make the circumferential incision. Now, I will incorporate a little bit of the outer third skin, and I will go in like this, and my point of my knife is on the bone, and I will come around like that and join up with my superior incision there, put my knife back in, keeping the point of the knife on the bone, and I will come around and join up with my tympanomastoid suture incision, which is right there. Now, at this point, we're ready to go behind the ear. And we'll swing the scope out of the way here like this. And we'll go behind the ear. Now, let me have the knife, uh, four by four first. I have already injected behind here, as I said. Now, what I was pointing out to you downstairs is this. I want to make sure, here's the ear canal, and I want to have a good look through that from behind. Therefore, I want to make sure that my incision, inferiorly and superiorly, get by the point where I can easily get the ear forward that far. Do you see? Okay. So I will start this right underneath the lobule of the ear and right in the posterior fold. Then I like to come out of the fold and come up above the ear. It's just my habit. Now, I'll take a retractor. Now, in order to control bleeding at this point, I will use a retractor, and I will also use that retractor to lift the areolar tissue off so that as I go down like this, the areolar tissue falls away. And again, I use the retractor at this point to control the hemoglobin. Not as well as I'd like to, though, huh? <laughs> so. Again, I'm pulling up on the areolar tissue so that as I go down, I get right down to the true fascia layer, and there it is coming up there. We shall go back and put the retractor deeper. So I want to get the areolar tissue off this at this point, if at all possible. In, get it elevated like this, get the areolar tissue off the true fascia layer. 
Now at this point, I'll get my retractor out. I'm going to see if we can ignore the bleeding for the moment here and finish the incision. I'll go right down to the bone at this point and come up to the edge of my incision. Now let's uh, hold the ear and give me a tissue forceps and the bovi. Okay. Take the knife. Good. Okay. We'll see if we can identify this area. There we go. On. See if we can identify this other side of it on. A uh, question comes up about the bovi incision. Again, this is something that uh, the uh, neuroautology group uh, offers. They prefer, uh, I've tried it, I don't like it as well on. I find it the best thing to try it way off, and it was my feeling, correctly or incorrectly, that it slowed down healing, but maybe that's not true on. The, uh, the way I use it. All right, fine. Now, we'll go ahead at this point. Um, let me have the knife. What I have done then, I have the incision made, and I went right down to the bone, up to the level of the floor of the ear canal. I went down through the soft tissue at that point. I'll cut that soft tissue forward in a minute. But now what I want to do is to identify the linea temporalis, I've identified it with the edge of my instrument right there, and I will cut along it and join up with this part of the incision there. Now, at this point, I will stop and take fascia. May I have a retractor, please? And we'll put this in. Now, I like to put a little injection under the fascia. Let me have the bigger retractor, would you? Um, now, let me have an injection. Now, what I will do here, I found this helps me. I'll tell you, I used to call it the Bruner injection. One of our men here on fellowship, Bob Bruner, told me that if he injected under the fascia, it got out a little bit easier. Let me have the knife. It just balloons it up. I'm not injecting into the fascia. I'm directing, uh, dissecting under it. Now, we'll go ahead. I take a bit bigger piece of fascia than Malcolm does, make an incision in it, start the elevation, to get the muscle away from it this way. Then I'll put a right angle retractor, hand retractor, in like this. Slip it in. Now let me have the scissors. And we shall blunt dissect to make sure we're all well and good. We will blunt dissect underneath the uh, fascia like that. And then I'll start to cut it out. But to do that, why I will give this to my nurse. And she'll give me the forceps. And away we go here. We'll go ahead and get this cut out or try to. You ever, and I usually cut pretty well left-handed. I think Carol must have given me her scissors. She has trouble at times. She's lefty. And she has trouble at times cutting uh, this. I'm going to have to cut it with my right hand because my left hand isn't working well on it. Sorry about that, folks, but I've got to see what I'm doing. Apologize. OK, you can take that out. Now, I'm going to just leave that on a little block here, and my nurse will put it aside temporarily and do nothing with it other than not drop it on the floor. That's, that's the only rule. I want you to let me have a bovie. <laughs> uh, pick it up and use it on. <laughs> well, I'm glad you agree. Let me have a large periosteal elevator. Now, this periosteal elevator is designed to be used in a manner parallel to the bone. So you put it down here and scrape it on the bone like that. Well, I've got, let's take this out now. We'll put it up here on the, along the root of the zygoma, and I will try to stick the bone. He's got a lot of heavy tissue here. He's a big man. Now, I'm pushing forward the vascular strip, which you can see. Yeah, let me have a weapon now. Now, I will put my weapon in here like this, get in the incision line, lift up like this. There's the vascular strip, pops right out on me. I take a quick look at it to see if it needs any trimming, and it does. Let me have a small, heavy scissors. There's a little bit of skin that I've got in my suction here that will just trim out of the way. All right, let me have the weapon and the big retractor. This is the big one, all right? Now, I will pick up the vascular strip in my weapon, put my, my retractor under it, and let's see if I can find that bleeder again. Here, take this. We've got a bleeder up here. Tell you what, we might as well make it bleed more. Let me have a, let me have a freer. We'll cut out this tissue over the root of the zygoma, and he's going to bleed more when I do that. Let's see if I can. Let me have the large periosteal elevator, would you? He's just very thick and well attached here. Let's see if I can get this separated. Well, there we go. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. 
Now, but I still want to get some out here. Let me have the hemostat. Now, this is taking out this. For those of you who've done uh, end oral surgery, know about this little bit of tissue over the root of the zygoma. You take out a little uh, triangle of it to give you a little better exposure over the root of the zygoma, and there's always a bleeder along the inferior edge. Now we will wash out the ear canal, and I will check at this point to make sure that I have adequate exposure in terms of my oracle being out of the way. And here again, I'll probably get my head in your way. Now that looks reasonably good. Okay, let me uh, switch back to the microscope at this point. Now the first thing I do when I switch back to the microscope is look at the fascia. Now as opposed to Malcolm, I don't trust my nurse. <laughs> no, I like to look at it myself and fiddle with it. Let me have the, so that's right, and the, um, now I'll go to, I'm going to go to the 250 lens here. They'll see more of it, too. This 250 lens that I'm using here, and I'll chat a bit while I'm looking at, I'm going to look at the undersurface of the fascia and trim off any muscle that's attached to it, muscle. The 250 lens that I'm using right now has some very definite advantages that I like when I'm doing mastoid surgery, particularly, I use it for all the time, actually. You have, a, you have a lower magnification, a larger field, and a greater depth of field. That is, you can be in focus on the mastoid cortex and on the lateral semicircular canal simultaneously, for instance. When I make canal incisions in stapes, wife, or, or something like that, I, with a 250 lens, I don't have to keep readjusting my focus. It'll stay in focus all the way down the ear canal. Then, when I get down to the point where I don't need a depth of field, I'll switch to, a, uh, to the 200 lens, which is relatively easy to do. All right, now we'll put it on the fascia press. Now this fascia press, which I designed, as Malcolm said, we, it came initially when I started using fascia for stapes a number of years ago, needed a way to get the fascia prepared quickly. So I used Howard's gel foam press and uh, put the fascia in it this way, and then put a piece of gel foam on top of it, and the fascia was dry and ready to use in five minutes. And my nurse said, well, why don't we do this with your tympanoplasties? Whereupon I designed this, and then found out that somebody else had designed it first. But uh, now, what my nurse will do, and I'm gonna do it for you, we'll take now and put a piece of gel foam in this. Now, what happens is, and she'll take it out of the field, and she will close it. Now, when she closes it, and she'll leave it in only about three to five minutes, but what that does, it takes the liquid out of it very quickly. Then she opens it up, leaves it attached to the stage of the uh, stage of the press, and puts it under a light to dry it out. Now, I'll get you to take a look here. Let me have the beaver knife first. Why? Beaver knife. We're going to complete this incision right up here that I didn't complete. Now let me have a rosin needle and point out at high power, I mean at low power, my 200 lens, what we got. Now as we look here, the vascular strip is right up there under the retractor. Here is your spine of Henley. Now running right along here, you see, is the tympanosquamous suture, and here is your tympanomastoid suture. Now the perforation still isn't very visible. I'll show it to you down here right now. And we'll, we'll see it much better later, but it's right there posteriorly, superiorly, right. Okay. Now, what we'll do is we'll give you a good high power view. Number two knife. Number two knife. All right. Now, I've taken a little bit of the outer third skin. Now, that'll help it so I won't have to worry about which end is out. I'll be able to see it. Okay. Now, I start up here using my knife in a direction tangential to the ear canal and go like this get it down on the bone, and then you see how it cuts off like that, see? And go around the corner down here like that. Now there we go. Now we'll get up here. Again, putting the knife tangential to the bone and moving it this way. And we get this off up here, it says in the book. Anyway, what we're gonna do now is working all the time perpendicular to the direction of the remnant. We're working like this, keeping our instrument on the bone, now you see what happens is with this lens, I go out of focus down here and I have to keep readjusting the focus, which I wouldn't do if I were working with a 250 lens. Continue to keep working. He's got some exostosis right here. I think you can see that diffuse exostosis. Got a, and uh, let's see if we can get this out of here, off here. Let me have a, let me have a good cup. 
Now this is, uh, what's happened here is the periosteum that dips in quite strongly here, and what we're going to do is just reach in and see how I stripped that out with a cup? I couldn't get an instrument in, I just took a hold of it and stripped it down. That was the principle, one of the principles I was trying to talk about the yesterday in terms of getting the, uh, getting the skin off the, uh, the drum. Let's have a weapon, good. We'll continue to work in a direction perpendicular to the uh, remnant. Now let's have, um, let me have a cup forceps. Now, you can't see it, but the short process of the malleus is right there. And what I'm going to do is to try to start stripping this off, because I'm in a tight spot down here. Now, you can see it come off down there, I hope. Let's see. Can you see that? See it come right off the remnant down there deep? All right, once I've got that started right there, you see, now I can switch back to using my weapon. Well, let me have a mastoid curette first, a large, a short handled mastoid curette, because that's going to get in my way, and I'll switch back to my 200 lens. 250 lens, so I've got more room, because this is just getting in my way, and I don't want to have to continue to fight it. So we'll go ahead and get this out of the way so I can see better what I'm doing. Otherwise, it's, a, it's really an overhang. All right, now I'm working now parallel to the remnant. Do you see? Perpendicular to it until I get to it, and then parallel to it. And you can't see this, unfortunately, but when this instrument sits here, part of the instrument, this part of the instrument sits on the drum, this part sits on the bone, and that part holds the annulus in place so that you can just go round the corner, then turn your instrument this way and use it like a spoon. All right, now the canal skin is off now. Let me have a cup forceps and we'll take it out. Now, I have not made an attempt at this point. Right here, I'm not quite right. Yes, I am too. I've not made an attempt to get the skin off the drum remnant. I'll do that after I drill, and I'm ready to drill right now. Let me get the canal skin here. Okay. Now, my nurse will put this in some tissue saw and save it. Now, we're ready to drill, and for that, I will go to the 250 lens, because that will make it far better, and you'll see better too, actually. Now, roll the table, uh, uh, roll the table towards me a turn. Hold it. Let me have a rosin needle that I can point with while you're getting the suction going, irrigation. Now, as we look down here now, in fact, I'll tell you what, we'll look down this way, and then I'll go back. As we look down here now, We've got an overgrowth of tympanic bone here and all around and all around. So we've got a lot. And I will drill some of this off to get a better view at the annulus posteriorly and drill enough of this off so I can see the entire annular ligament without changing the position of my microscope, hopefully. All right. Now, what I will use is about a number seven barren suction irrigation. Uh, because that'll just fit in the ear canal, and I will use a drill here that corresponds to about a number 12 to 14 burr. All right, let her rip. And we'll take this post posteriorly first. Turn the, that's good, that's good. We'll take this off posteriorly first. Turn the water down a bit, please. That's good, fine, thank you. Off a second. All right, now what I'm doing here, I'm working, uh, I'm working uh, to get this taken off and to create a little shelf of bone. What you want to do is to get this completely opened up. All right, roll it off, roll the table away a bit, please. You're going to have to tighten up the uh, microscope balancing device a bit, just a couple of clicks, if you would. Uh, you, so we're taking this off, trying to be careful. Off a second. Uh, try, oh, on again. Trying to be careful not to, uh, not to get into the soft tissue, although it's no great serious problem if you do. It just makes it more difficult for the surgeon. and opening this up so that we have a nice big ear canal to work in. Now, I have not checked the articular chain yet, but I'm just avoiding touching it off. All right, on. Well.
Being very careful not to touch the malleus. Now, in order to stabilize my burr, I'm resting it on the bone out here, and that lets me use it almost like having two hands on it. Can you see that, Daryl? Yeah. See, because I want to have complete, and I'm pivoting it on the bone, and that way it won't get caught on a little spicula bone and do something it weren't supposed to do, hopefully. Or if it does, then I can always blame the bone, you see. Particularly when you're down near the anteriorly or where off. And we'll get this opened up. Now you can see he's got a lot of tympanous sclerosis in the rest of his drum. On. Yes, use a gem. Now I noticed Malcolm using a diamond. I used to use a diamond too, and I guess, uh, I think probably if I used the air drill, I'd use a diamond, but the diamond would go too slow with this drill. This is a Jordan Day bone engine with a cavo handpiece. Cavo handpiece is delightful. It's what's replaced the Wolstein. They don't make the Wolstein anymore, and it's really a better handpiece anyway. Now I'm making off a bit, I'm making a little extra room right up here superiorly. Short process of malleus is right there. Making some extra room because that's where the fascia tends to bunch up. On. Now I'm aware of the fact, Daryl, that you don't have a big picture, but it just makes it a lot easier for me to have a little bit better depth of field here. Good. Off. Now, at this point, we'll go back to my 200 lens. Pump the table up, please. And we'll go down and make sure we got all the skin out of the sulcus, that we've de-epithelized the tympanic membrane remnant, and then we're ready to go into the middle ear. Hold it. Good. Now, let me, uh, I'm going to need a little bit more tension in that, too, if you would. Okay. Let me have a weapon. Now, I'm looking down into anterior sulcus. This doesn't look like I left any skin, but I want to make absolutely certain that I haven't. That's periosteum. Make sure that I haven't. Oh, we haven't got all the bone off here, though, have we? We've got quite a still, but let me have the stapes curat, would you? Still a little ridge of bone here. I might as well get it off. Might as well get it off, and then I'm... It's not that critical, particularly if we end up with this big a remnant. If we don't, why, it might be. There's Umbo, malleus handle, short process. Here we are looking into the middle ear and skin on the promontory. Now, I will make an incision through the drum at this point. Just a second here. Let me have a, uh, let me have a good cup, would you? And to take off the edge of skin as I do this, let me get rid of this little bit of tag of stuff, whatever it is. It might be some skin in it. I'm not sure why. I don't think there is here, but I'm not sure. Let me have a scissors, middle ear heavy. Okay, and we'll get this cut off. All right. All right, now let me have a number one knife again. The middle ear mucosa, what I can see of it uh, right up in this region, looks very good. No, it doesn't either. That's cholesteatoma. Oh, I'll be darned. You see that? All right. Well, we had more here. Now, what looked like, well, now, there's no question now that the whole drum's got to come out. So here we're going in here. That's cholesteatoma, too. Yeah. So we've got this thing filling his middle ear. Interesting, isn't it? Very short history, and it didn't look that way at all. So what I'm doing is just leaving the annular ligament and the edge of the drum right at that point. And we're going to circumscribe this and get the middle ear aspect of it cleaned up. Let's see here. Well, let's get this out of the way. Let's just take it off the malleus. Let me have a good cup, would you? Yep, well, he has a lot more than it appeared. There's no question about that. All right, here's the rest of the drum remnant coming out. And then we can get in there and uh, let's get this off the malleus. Let me have a uh, white, please. Let me have a, a let, I'll tell you what I should do right now, I'm pretty sure, but I should show you is the, uh, whether there's any ink. Uh, no, 
No, the ossicular chain does not appear to be intact. Uh, I can feel stapes here, I think, and I do not feel a connection. All right, now that I know that, we'll go back to what I was doing, and I don't have to worry about jostling the malleus a bit. Uh, here, you can send that to the pathologist. That's part of our specimen. More specimen? Yeah, it does, but I can't tell whether there's matrix left behind, Daryl. I don't know whether this is just stuff there, some more dumped out. You know, dumped out cholesteatoma or is actually growing. Sometimes you, it's just debris. Now, at this point, I can see good mucosa down in the tube. Can you see down there? Okay. Okay. Well, we've got good mucosa in the tube itself, and it doesn't appear any more skin, but we don't have any elsewhere. Well, I'd already told this man that I thought we were going to have to do this in stages, and that's for sure. Now, we'll continue to work around. I've pretty well taken care of it anteriorly superiorly. Now we're working into anteriorly inferiorly. And there are some cells down in here, Darrell, that have good mucosa in them. All right, now roll the table towards me. Now we'll come around posteriorly inferiorly. And I always proceed this way uh, when I'm cleaning out the middle ear with the cholesteatoma. Hold it. Anterior superior, then anterior inferior, then anterior posterior inferior. Now, let's see what we got here. This is just as a general rule, it's a systematic way of doing it, that's all. And I always dissect it all up to the level of the oval window and then leave that to do after the mastoidectomy. Is that what you meant? Yeah. They said, so it doesn't make a difference which way you go as long as you don't do the, the oval window part first. Do it. I'll even save it till after the mastoidectomy so that if we get into a fistula inadvertently or something, we can stop. Now, this is just uh, peripheral to the, this is just some loose fibrous tissue or mucous membrane hypertrophy, and I'll get it out. Now, at this point, I think you can see to very quickly backtrack, recapitulate. We found the middle ear filled with cholesteatoma. We immediately cut out the remnants. We have taken it out of anterior, superior, inferior, and posterior inferior. It's all up here. Now we'll cut this out. Let me have a big middle ear scissors. We'll cut this out and then probably proceed to the mastoidectomy. Get this out of the way. You can add this to the tissue that you send in to Dr. Carberry. This is a uh, hockey stick. I call it a hockey stick. It's also listed and called a jimmy. And some even people even call it a crab tree dissector. We've got a number of sizes of this. Now here's the corda tympani right here. Corda tympani is bound up with disease, and I will cut it right now. Let me have a scissors. I'm not going to try to dissect the stuff off of it. Middle ear. And we'll cut the corda on both sides and get it out of the way that I suspect. Well, I don't know what we're going to find the epitympanum. We may not have much going on up in the mastoid. I don't know. What I want to do is to separate the edge of the cholesteatoma at this point. And I, you know, I was mentioning, I think I mentioned to some of you. No, I didn't mention, I guess. I went as a student to Professor Portman and Guy Lachey, Lachey's course this July, and I, gosh, last July, and I hardly recommend it. It was a delightful course. And it's interesting to see the same thing accomplished with the same objectives in a slightly different way. All right, now I have finished now getting that off of here. The reason that made it, they would go ahead and put a mirror down here to see what's upstairs, and they would probably take a little bone off. I do not. We do not, generally speaking. Uh, I think we may not have much in the mastoid, but I can't. Now, I've got good mucosa. Let me show you this. Now, that's cochlearform process right where my needle is. And there's good mucosa on the cochlearform process right there, pincer tympani tendon. Capitulum of stapes is right at this point. I can just feel it. Well, now at this point, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I may, I'm going to make a decision right now. And what I'll do is let me have my hockey stick again. I'm going to palpate to see if I can palpate incus. I'm going to have to get this blessed skin out of the way a little better so we can see up there better. Let me not go now and let's see how that is. All right, let me have the, uh, let, me, let me have a, um, 
the hockey stick. Now, we're looking down here. What I want to do is palpate Incas, and here it is. You see that? Now, Daryl, as you know, that probably means we haven't got anything upstairs. But there's no cholesteatoma on it. Now, let me have a curette. At this point, I will take a little bone off at this point because I'm going to want a piece of thick elastic, by the way. I'm going to take a little bone off now because I know that all I have to do is to get just an ounce more of exposure and I'm all set. Now, here comes the Incas. Now, the reason I wanted to get it out at this point is this. Let me have the Incas hook again. I will take it out and look at it and make sure that it doesn't have skin on it. And if it doesn't, the chances are then that we don't have anything any further. So um, now, see, that's looking pretty good. If we take a look at this, that's why I wanted to stop at that point. Normally, if I'm going to do the mastoid, I'd leave the Incas in because the short cruise is my, one of my landmarks. But I took it out here now to see if there was any evidence of any problem here, and there isn't. Therefore, we probably know we won't. Now, take this. Yeah, it does. It has good mucous membrane. I'll tell you what I'd like you to do. Uh, you, may, uh, you may take that and autoclave it, and we'll probably go ahead and make a fitted prosthesis, and we'll reconstruct it. Doctor's going to be very happy. As I told him, it's going to be a two-step procedure, I was sure. Let's have our hockey stick. If I thought a control hole was necessary, I'd go into the mastoid through the cortex, Darrell, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. We don't want to have holes up in here that are going to retract in pockets and so forth. All right. Well, now at this point, roll the table back towards me a little more. Now we can go ahead and finish. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Let me, uh, Jay, we will have to do this in two stages because we're probably going to have to look at some of the, yes, of course we will. I'm sorry. I, uh, I mistook thing. I, I, we will have to do it in two steps with all that mucosa gone, of course. And I wasn't thinking when I said that. Let me have a number one knife. I, Darrell, I'm surprised you didn't correct me. Uh, I have got good mucosa in the epitympanum and way in the tube, but I think it would be a little foolish to try to do this in two steps from the overall sample. We're getting the skin off of the malleus at this point. Furthermore, we're going to have an immobile, uh, hypermobile situation here, so we're best to do it in two steps now. All right, let me have a good cup. Let me have a good cup. We're working on getting the skin off of the malleus. No, I don't, uh, I don't, you want, what about the mastoid? Okay. Now, we at this point, let's take a quick look here at the um, malleus. We've got some remnant left on the malleus, but it doesn't appear that there's any skin. There's the stub of the corda. We've got some edematous looking uh, material here attached to the, uh, that's edematous mucosa. All right. Now, uh, roll the table towards me some, and we're, I want to take a look more posteriorly. Hold it. Let's have a hockey stick three. Now, you see we're at the point we fin all the only place where our disease now remains is attached to stapes. Well, here's stapes capitulum. I'll show that to you right now. There's your stapes capitulum right at this point. But the only place we have it left attached is right here. And we'll get that off right now, and we're home free. Dr. Baxter, we're at the point where if there's some way that you can eliminate nitrous and still keep them asleep, that would be good. So I'll comment on that. We didn't talk about that earlier. Any gas, any gaseous anesthesia? Jim, I don't want to yeah. We talked about that while you were getting ready. Oh, did you? Oh, fine. Good. Okay. Now. Uh, let me see. Well, I think that's it, Daryl. There you go. Wife? Yeah, you can see the back of it. Yeah, wife. Yeah, I can see the back of it easily, yeah. And so we're, uh, we're through, really, as far as that goes, except just putting it back together now. Now, roll the table away. Now, next step is to pick, get the proper size elastic. Thick elastic, I would like it cut. Uh, hold it. Give me a piece that measures about uh, one centimeter circular, or roughly that, would you? All right, now let's just take a look at all we got here. Let me have a rose and needle here, rose and needle, and let's just, let's just talk about what we're going to do. 
Now, we've got a number of things here. In the first place, we've got the missing mucous membranes through a large part of the middle ear. There is some right here over the promontory and up here in the anterior epitympanum, but there's a lot missing. Uh, furthermore, even if we, uh, even now, secondly, we've got a hypermobile malleus handle. Watch. See? All right, secondly, or thirdly, now I'm trying to point out all of the various considerations. Thirdly, the stapes is posteriorly located, and if we tried to put something in between the two, do you see what it would do with the malleus handle? Would push it anteriorly. Now, if there was no mucous membrane problem, I'd go for a hearing result in this case because of the fact that if it didn't work out, I wouldn't have lost a lot. But I've got two or three things here, all of which dictate to me that... Uh, now, Daryl, uh, you've seen the situation. Uh, if you were doing this, would you do it in two steps? Forces? Yeah. You probably wouldn't. You mean borderline and you told him it was going to be, you might do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, Daryl, I'll be quite frank with you. If I had a better situation in terms of the malleus handle, I think I probably would myself. Now, here's my thick piece of elastic. It's too big. In other words, if I could do it in one step and know that if it failed, the failure would not be something that would interfere with the doing, with the getting a, a successful second operation. Okay. Now here's the piece of thick elastic I'm going to use. It needs to be trimmed down. We'll go ahead and trim it down right now. All right. Let me have a let me have a four by four here to cut on, and we'll cut. This is the five hundredth inch. This is the five hundredth inch elastic. Um, Let's see here. So I'm trimming this around here, and we'll put this in, and this will hold its position just as if I'd filled it with paraffin. Now, let me have an Incas hook, and we'll see if this fits. This is going to be, you want it fairly snug. Yeah, that, that's quite true, as Daryl was saying, that I could take off, I could take off a lot of bone back here and look if I wanted to. I don't need to, but I could. But I think I've got everything taken care of, and I can take it off at the second stage much easier without having a retraction pocket form. Oh, blessed thing seems to be a little bit too big, doesn't it? All right, let's have the... Uh, just a minute. There we go. No, that's what I want. All right, roll the table back towards me, and let's take a look at this. It's perfect. I'm going to use that hook again. Hold it. Suction and rosin needle. Now, I have the thick elastic in here. Now, what this is going to do, this is fairly snug. It'll move some, but it not all that, won't move that much. And what it'll do is more, well, it may not be snug enough. Wait a minute. No, it's all right. Now, that extends down into the tube. I think you can see that. It goes well down into the tubotympanum, past the point where we've got missing mucous membrane. It, um, it is covering all areas, and now I'll show you how it'll come out on the second stage, hopefully. <laughs> I've never had... Let's have an Incas hook. I had one that I had real trouble getting it out once, but usually I don't. Now, this is stiff material, but we'll try to demonstrate. Now, when I turn a tympanal meatal flap, I'll put in an incus hook like this, hook into it, and just do that, see? Take it right out. Now, you can take it all the way out of the mass. Let's take a quick look at this material here under the microscope. It's stiff enough so that it won't easily be deformed, but look, you can, with under pressure, you see, take it and bend it like that, you see? Okay. At this point, we'll pack the ear canal and also take our retractor out. Now, the reason is this. I'm going to take the retractor out. Have you got a piece of gel foam first? I'm going to take the retractor out so that if there's going to be bleeding, it bleeds now, not when I've got everything all in place. Just an ordinary canal packing gel foam. Here you go. Let's put it over here. I'll get it. Oh, all right, got it. Now, first I'll put a piece of gel foam down here like this. 
Then we'll put a little sponge that I can suck on. It's just an ordinary sponge. I prefer it to cotton. And this is a strip of selvaged edge gauze. That's good. Now, that has my injection solution on it, but I've aspirated. Now, what that's there for, that's to make sure you want to uh, that's to make sure that when I take the retractor out and it bleeds, that it doesn't bleed all in my middle ear. Now, I've taken the retractor out now so that if it's going to bleed, it'll do so now, not later. All right, now we're going to take a look at fascia. Now we'll take a look at fascia. I want to I demonstrate to you, if I can, how beautifully thin this is from the press. You see that, Darrell? And you can really, it comes out very nice and even and not curled up. These thick edges are where it hung over the edge of the press. All right, let me have the uh, small heavy scissors. We'll cut off the pieces. Now, your question always comes up, do you always take that big a piece of fascia? Yes, then I have much more flexibility in terms of having what I want and the thickness I want if I have some parts of it that are too thick. Let's have a ruler. Now this probably measures about 3 by 18. That's 18. That's 3. Now what we want to do, the fascia is very thin. And being thin, it is less critical that you have it exactly the right size. What I'm going to do here first is to cut off a portion of it that I probably won't use at all. And my nurse will hold that aside. And if I don't use it, she may put it in with my homograph fascia. You want to hook that? Now that's for a little patch. That's a patch that I may put over the malleus handle. And then we'll go ahead and get this cut down to about the right size, and she'll save the pieces for patches. Now let's have a ruler. Now it measures now about 14, well, 14 and a half, since Daryl's there. 14 and a half by about 18, 19. OK, that's just perfect. We're going to take off just a little bit of this to round it out. Now we're going to go ahead and cut the slit for the malleus handle. And I'll do it this way. And I'm cutting this with the idea that I may take this and turn this over on the malleus handle like that. Do you see? Maybe not. It will depend. I may do something else with it. Now you really do want to be careful in cutting it. Malcolm pointed this out. You want to make sure that the distance from here to there is certainly no less than eight millimeters. And let's see what I've got. I've got, uh, I've got nine, which is just about right. Perfect, as usual. Let me have a forceps. So now uh, what I do is give this to my nurse in the general way that I want it handed to me. And the way I usually do it is grab a hold of it like this so I have hold of both pieces like that. And then I'll dunk it later, OK? Now we'll take a look at the canal skin. Now, I like to look at the canal skin myself. And uh, we'll put it this way. This, the outer portion is up there. And the, uh, uh, the suction is what I want here, don't I? Yeah. That's all right. So we have the scissors. Now, what I do at this point is to try to get rid of any little bits that look like they might turn under or give me troubles or make it so I have to fiddle around and get rid of little bits like this that might turn around. Then we take this and we take a look and get this. Now, let me show you something here. Now, this is perfectly good skin, but Daryl, this is going to get in my way. Do you see when I go to put it in? Because it sticks out that way. Therefore, I'll just cut that off and throw it away because it's, it's going to get in my way anyway. Now we'll take a look at the other side of the skin. Now let me have the hold the block. And I'll show you something I do. I didn't talk about it yesterday because of the fact that I didn't think that others did it. And I wanted, I just felt rather than to confuse the issue, I'd let you pick it up here. Now I find that this will spread out better in the position I want it if I cut it right here, because that breaks up the tendency to hold it in a circular fashion. Furthermore, when you go to put this in, you often get air bubbles behind it. So to do that, we put little holes in it like that to let the air bubbles out. Now, my nurse will keep this moist, and she will just pick it up on that, at that area here, the outer portion, when I'm ready for it. All right? The next step is to take out our, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I want to get this over the TV camera, John. I'm going to, I'm going to, because I don't want the, to use the overhead light. What I'm going to do now 
And if I'm not in focus, tell me, and I'll keep it. I'm, just, I'm not looking through the microscope. Am I in reasonably good focus? Okay. <coughs> to get the bleeding stopped. On. Well, that's another advantage of the 250 lens, do you see? done here now is to make sure that on the occurred. All right, let's have the retractor. Any bleeding that's occurred hopefully is going to have, have, have occurred at this point and I won't have to fight it later. Now we're ready to go back into the ear and put things in place. All right. Let's have the suction, a number three band, and we'll go ahead and get our graft and things in place. Now here, this plastic then is being used to prevent adhesions between the drum and the medial wall. I will probably go back in and put in a fitted prosthesis if the situation is favorable. But Daryl, it's a little bit on the horizontal side. You know what I mean? Portion. Or did that, was that apparent from what I said? Yeah. All right, now we take everything out. Everything's nice and dry. And this is an important part of the operation. Get things dry. Okay, let's have the fascia. Now the first thing, on my nurse has picked it up. I'm going to dunk it in some nice clean tissue saw, and then we'll put it in the ear. Okay? And I sort of massage it. There we go. All right. Now, we've got this backwards. All right. We'll put it in this way. Now, all right, now let me have the blue ear loop. You heard Malcolm talk about it. I use this. I don't know how I'd operate without it. I use it for everything. It's nice. Let me show you. It's nice because you can suck through it like this and hold things in place. I use it for everything. It's a wax ear loop. All right. Now, you identify the area where you have your slit like that. You get it down here, you push down on like that, and you come underneath the malleus handle like this, and there you go. And there's your, now, you, then you take a hold. Let me get this in position for you. Once you've got it up there, you brace your fascia with your, with your suction, and then move this out so it doesn't pull the fascia out. Then rose and needle. The next step is to take a rose and needle and to tuck it up like this, tight. Now let me have the ring again. Tell you what, let me have a let me have a medium canal packing gel foam. I'm going to put some gel foam in here to help support this. Uh, let's bring it over here. I'll just put it in this way. Now, uh, this will help make it easier to make this fascia lie in place. It'll just give me an artificial remnant. All right, now let me have the ring, and we'll go ahead picking the fascia up with the suction, and the, using the ring and putting it in place like this. And we'll look up here. And right now, I'm not being too critical with it. I just want to get it in general good space. Now, I'll tell you something you can do there that I've done. If you have too much fascia and you want to get rid of it, just tuck some of it under the remnant like that. Do you see? Uh, you don't have to do that very often, but sometimes. Now, what we want to do up here, here's the, now what I'm going to do is this. Make sure, I'll take this. Be ready, please. Now, when I say be ready, that means be ready to do it. It's one of the first things we teach our nurses is how to do it when they start to work for us. And it's an extremely important maneuver. Now, what I've done by turning that down, by, well, hell, I didn't hear any laughs. I was figured I would get some reactions. No, do it. There was a little concern, huh? Do it, do it, do it, do it. That means to pinch the suction because you've got something caught in it. Now, what I'm going to do here, I want to make sure that I have this covered. By turning this down, I got rid of excess fascia that was up superiorly. And now what I'm going to do is to overlap this a bit like that. You see? OK. Now, let me have the ring again. Yes. There's a, we say do it means to pinch the suction. And when I say please be ready, that means be, get your hand on the suction so that if I say do it, you don't have to scramble. It's already there. Let me have a, a medium canal packing gel foam. 
This was a bigger perforation than I judged, and I cut my fascia almost a little short. Uh, when it's going to go under the malleus handle, normally 13 millimeters is adequate. Uh, I would have been better here with 15, or 15 and a half, or as Barbara would say, or 15 and three quarters. So what I'm doing here is just putting this here to help support it so it won't get sucked in, you know? All right. Now, you take a look here and make sure that all is well. And all, all looks pretty good. All looks pretty good. Now, uh, we won't even need to use that little patch that I cut because we've got things pretty well covered here. All right, roll the table away a bit, please. Now, we roll it away just a little bit to get a better look for the... Hold it, canal skin. All right, canal skin. Now, my nurse has picked it up in the proper way. Uh, I put it down like this, ring, push it down into the ear canal. Now, I will not probably put this in as far as Malcolm. I will initially, but then I'll pull it out. Go ahead and push this in uh, over the surface of the fascia to start off with, like this. Because I put the holes in it, you see I didn't get bubbles on the thing. Uh, let's see here. Now, I've, I'm not going to leave it spread out quite like that on the drum. I put it that way, however, to unroll the skin edges. You'll see what I'll do. I've spread it out. Then what I'll do after I get it that way is to do this. And this will make sure that my skin edges are unrolled. You see how it lifts up? There we go, like that. Tuck it into place. Now, at this point, we've got it so that it's just barely covering all around the edge for about a millimeter. And at this point, we're ready to put in that first piece of packing, which is a small rolled up piece of dry gel foam. Let's have the ring again. Now I'm going to go back to a little lower power because I don't have enough depth of field. Now we'll push this into place. Now my, my, my game plan here, Daryl, for your benefit, all right, packing. My game plan, Daryl, for your purposes, I'm gonna put in the packing, then I'm gonna put in one post auricular stitch, and then go back and show the positioning of the vascular strip. Here, now I'm leaving a trough superiorly. You'll notice I'm leaving a trough superiorly. Now I'm going to block that trough. That's where the vascular strip's going to go. I'm going to block it with another piece of gel foam so that if I get bleeding, and that's all for the moment, if I get bleeding while I'm sewing up. Now what I'm going to do here to take out my retractor, when we have a frere, push the vascular strip on top of the gel foam. Make sure it gets in. All right, take this. Now let me have a suture. So I'm just going to put one stitch to tack this into place before I go ahead and put the vascular strip into place. And if you can't see it, that's tough right at this point because it won't take me long to do this. And then we'll let you all go ahead. Okay, cut. Fine. Now, roll the table towards me, please. Let me have a nasal speculum and a number five baron. Hold it. Now, I like the nasal speculum for doing injections and for this stage of the operation. And I'll turn Dellenberg, please. If the table is low as it'll go, hold it. Good. Okay. It's a little bit easier to work with, and you don't have to push it in. You can put it in, open it up, and draw it out. Let me have a forceps. Now, there's the vascular strip. Let's get you back to a 200 lens. There's the vascular strip. We'll go ahead and uh, take it out like this, pick, put it under the blade of my retractor, suction. I will take a suction and pull out the, the little wick, the plug of the gel foam. That opens up the slot where I want this vascular strip to go, forceps. I will take, you've got a big ear, take this and put this down back where it was. Let's have a ring. That show pretty good now? Very nice. Thanks. Okay. Put that down. It's overlapping the fascia. Then take some of that fascia do it, and then we just go ahead. Let me get this out. All right. We'll continue here to put our packing in. This is packing that's been soaked with uh, cordosporin. It's rather dry. You'll notice that it's quite a bit drier, actually, than 
the packing you've seen some of the others put in. It's just that I prefer it that way. It's not quite as mushy. And um, we'll continue here to put it in. Now, I, I realize that uh, it, uh, the exact reason for the staging here may not have been completely clear. Uh, may not have been completely clear. The reason was there, the two or, there were two or three factors. The mucous membrane was on a marginal situation. I did have mucous membrane. I did have mucous membrane in the epitympanum, and I had it in the tube and a little on the promontory, but generally around the periphery I didn't. Piece of cotton then. I'm just a little short of the, but that's all right. Um, uh, that combined with a, with a hypermobile malleus handle and a bad angle with a stapes, and I just thought I'd be better off, let me have a bayonet, to do this in two steps in terms of getting the best result for him, bayonet, the best result for him. Now, we'll put, I'll put a piece of cotton here in the plug in the ear canal. That'll stay in for a couple of weeks. And at this point, we'll take him out of Trendelenburg and we'll go ahead and sew it up. <laughs>